coming up on tonight's episode of Living Ramadan. We speak to business entrepreneur Nadia Musaji. We bring you a non-Muslim's perspective on Ramadan. Nuha Esso provides an inspirational message. We visit Masjid Quds and have a look at their interfaith program. We travel abroad to bring you a global Ramadan perspective. And we end with a musical interlude. Salam. My name is Mehfub Bawa and this is Living Ramadan, Episode 7. We find ourselves in warmer state today. Behind me is the Azawiyah Masjid. And this was set up as an institute of learning by Sheikh Muhammad Saleh Hendricks in 1920. There have been three generations of uh, shuyukh at this masjid, starting with Sheikh uh, Muhammad Saleh Hendricks. There have also been Sheikhs Ahmad, Sheikh Mujahid Hendricks as well, uh, and uh, currently Sheikh Ahmad and Sheikh Siraj Hendricks, two brothers, are the uh, imamat at this masjid. We are going to be finding out a little bit more about the masjid as we continue with our uh, insert for today. Uh, but first, we are going to be listening to a very interesting interview with a wonderful woman who's doing so much to inspire young women in the field of engineering, and she's also a business entrepreneur herself. We speak to Nadia Musaji next. So Nadia is, I say, the wearer of many scarves. <laughs> um, I'm a mother, I'm an engineer, um, and I'm a social entrepreneur and a change maker. So I started uh, my nonprofit organization 10 years ago, um, and it was to develop women and girls within the engineering and technology industry. And um, ever since then, I have uh, become one of the kind of the leading voices for women empowerment, not just in Africa, but around the world on the issue of how do we get more women and girls into um, STEM uh, subjects, uh, which has landed me in the most amazing places around the world, including um, on thought leadership councils um, to inform government policy around how do we actually empower our women and girls around the world. I mean, this is a personal journey. I started out um, as an engineer myself, um, and in my class, the numbers were very, very skewed, um, which is representative around the world. Less than 10% of uh, engineers are women. And so what happened was, instead of complaining about the numbers um, and the issues that women face in the sector, I and a group of friends decided to actually do something about it and create a systemic, sustainable change. Um, and we do that through three programs. One is Girl Eng, which is a high school development program we run around the world in partnership with UNESCO. Um, we've got a university innovation challenge that we run to get more women and businesses into the industry and then we've got leadership development programs to help women break through the glass ceilings um, around the world within the engineering sector as well. So the pink hard hat is actually the signature of our Girl Eng program. Uh, we took something that was very masculine that represented engineering and we made it bright luminous pink. Um, and it's really fighting a stereotype with another stereotype. And these hats travel around the world. Um, we give them to girls to inspire them to study engineering. And um, we also travel with this hat and it, we take pictures at monuments around the world to showcase that engineering is everywhere. And then we get all sorts of people to take pictures with our hats. So everyday girls that um, want to study engineering, engineers, even President Trudeau has a selfie with this pink hard hat on. It's quite a coveted hat to have. <laughs> Yes, so Zara was um, also another passion. I mean, I love to eat um, and I love to go out. Um, and Cape Town just lacked really great halal places. And I got married to um, my husband, who is Turkish but ethnically Kurdish. Um, and when we came to South Africa, it was a difficult choice. Do we stay in Istanbul or do we stay uh, in Cape Town? Two of my favorite cities in the world. Um, and we decided to come here um, and create something that we'd like to go out to. Um, and he is an amazing chef by accident. Um, I didn't know he had this quality when I married him, so this was a bonus. Um, and we've built Sarai over the last one and a half years um, into one of the top restaurants in Cape Town. Um, good, good food, good service, um, and we open up later. Um, lots of our customers are Arabs and Turks because they eat at 10, 11 o'clock at night. So, you know, you'll come here on a Saturday night at 12, 1 o'clock, and you'll see this area just full of guys smoking shisha and having a good time like they would in their own countries. Ramadan actually is my favorite time of the year, and that's just because there's a bit of a focus for me. Um, I think it's because I'm not eating 
So I spend so much time eating that during Ramadan, I've got all that additional time to really focus on, on myself, on spiritual contemplation, on making the strategic decisions. Uh, and there's just some calmness around the world that I find um, during this time. And I've celebrated Ramadan in so many different countries. Um, I used to live in Germany and I celebrated it there, in Turkey as well, um, in South Africa. And I think for me, I really look forward to this time of the year because it brings a peace and a serenity in my life that I actually need because my life is so busy and noisy sometimes. <laughs> What a wonderful uh, interview with an uh, inspiring person, Nadia Musaji, doing so much to motivate young minds and also excelling as a business entrepreneur herself. In episode 7 today of Living Ramadan, we find ourselves at the Azavia Masjid here in uh, Cape Town in Warmay State. And uh, we have discovered that uh, there was uh, three generations of uh, Shayu who served as the imamate at the Masjid. Something else that's very interesting uh, from the notes given to me prepared by Shafiq Morton, one of the guests on our show as well. Imam Ghazali's works have been taught continuously here for 97 years, as if the works of Imam Nawawi, Abu Shuja and many other classical scholars. Uh, the, uh, at the Azavia, the sheikhs have been imbued with the authority to teach the deen by chains of transmission from the shayukh of Makkah. Now we are going to be uh, listening to a very interesting perspective of Ramadan from one of our non-Muslim friends. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Stevens, born and bred Cape Tonian. Just a quick one, just uh, talking about and looking at uh, the wonders of uh, spending Cape Town uh, or Ramadan in Cape Town over the years. As a Cape Townian, it's always been a unique time of the year uh, for those of us that uh, do not subscribe to the Muslim religion. I was always fascinated by how these uh, friends and families get together over this very holy time, time of reflection, and really just uh, are there for each other. And it's uh, a time of reflection, and it certainly inspires one in more ways than one just looking at how families become over this time and the celebration thereafter when these sacrifices have been made. It's, it's, a, it's a very specific time in a Muslim family or a Muslim person's life. And uh, I, for one, have certainly been truly inspired by the uh, family uh, uh, support that is shown over this period of time. Also, the uh, wonderful camaraderie and the love for their fellow men and fellow women over this time that is also shown. And obviously, there's uh, quite a lot of focus on the deprivation that is suffered by these individuals and the families. But that is all part of the sacrifice and uh, just uh, the rewards thereafter. <laughs> We are at the Azavia Masjid for episode 7 of Living Ramadan. Now, a very interesting feature of this masjid, as you can see behind me, are the four mihrabs. Now, the four mihrabs of this masjid represent tolerance and understanding of the four schools of thought in Islam. And that's uh, certainly a really wonderful spirit that is imbued within the Azavia Masjid. Next up, we're going to be listening to an inspirational message uh, from Nuha Esop. And thereafter, we're going to be taking a look at the interfaith program that is held annually at Masjid Kutz in Gatesville. There's something that I uh, always speak to my kids about and that is to not separate themselves from others and there's a lesson that I'm trying to teach them in that that yes we are always going to gravitate towards those who we feel are similar to us and those who we feel where we belong so to speak um, and that's a wonderful thing about communities and societies. You know, we all kind of cluster together. But we can't be communities in isolation. And we can't be groups with similar interests in isolation. We, we need to cross the bridge and we need to create bridges to other communities and other societies, people who don't sound like us, who don't look like us, who don't practice things that we do. Um, ultimately, we're one human race. And the only way that we bridge that divide between separation, the us and them, is to get to know others, to have a conversation with others, to ask them about their life, their ways, and to tell them about ours. 
and that our way isn't necessarily better than theirs and neither is theirs better than ours. We just are. So it's a wonderful thing that my kids uh, are beginning to practice and understand and it's been working for them. So you might just want to try that one. And then you are theoretically now in a heightened state of spirituality, ready to perform the prayers. So these are some of the last verses that you will find in the Holy Quran. In fact, these are the last three uh, chapters that you will find in the Holy Quran. And as you know that women play a major role in Islam, so much so that their importance is ranked way above men. We know that paradise is at the feet of your mother. Someone asked the Prophet Muhammad, who is the most important person in your life? And then he said, your mother. And then the person asked, who is the second most important person in your life? And then he said, your mother. <laughs> and who is the third most? Your mother. Mm. And then you could see the person wanted to know a bit more, and then, he said, and then your father. And paradise lies at the feet of the mother. Mm. So the importance of women in Islam, really we couldn't overemphasize that. Then I have a network of institutions and communities that will come here every day, come with their pots and their pans and fill up their containers, 30, 40 liters of soup, and off they go and they go and feed their community. Soup. 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 We make food. Food, and it's referred to as a soup kitchen, about a full meal. And they will come here, collect their food, and off they go. Kuds in Gatesville and today they have had their interfaith program, a program that they've been running very successfully for a number of years and with me is the uh, chairperson Faisal Roykov, the Majul Kuds uh, Executive uh, Management Board. Um, Brother Faisal, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Shukran for having us here today and really a very innovative program. How many years has it been running? This is our fifth interfaith program, Alhamdulillah. Uh, we started off on a, with a small group of individuals of 10 or 20 people. And Alhamdulillah, we've now grown to over 70 people that attend the interfaith program. What are some of the highlights that you've had over the years? Over the years, we've had really interesting guest speakers at the interfaith program. And I suppose last year was an absolute highlight for us when we had the Archbishop Desmond Tutu as our guest speaker at the interfaith program. Really a refreshing personality with a deep insight into his various activities that he's involved with. And it was an absolute pleasure to have him with us last year. What was the reason at the outset for embarking on a program like this? I think the interfaith program came about because of the difficult times we find ourselves in. 
Alhamdulillah in South Africa we are blessed that as a community of faith we are able to live with other communities of other faiths. And it's something that we thought we should never ever take for granted. It's one of the strengths of South Africans and it's something that we thought needs nurturing and needs constant attention so that we never lose that strength that we've come to love here in South Africa. Now aside from the interfaith program while I was here today I was told about another interesting program that you're embarking on and it's called Eid Angels. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Maybe during Ramadan Masjid al-Quds is a hive of activity. Lots of events taking place on a regular basis here at the Masjid. In fact we have an event every Sunday and on some of the Saturdays. But one of the highlights that we'll be embarking on pretty soon is a concept called Eid Angels. The idea here is to embrace and hug an orphan, especially for the day of Eid. So what we do is that we adopt an orphan for the day. And we go and speak to these orphans and we then ask them very personal questions about what it is that they would love to have for the day of Eid. Similarly, when you and I and we speak to our own kids, our kids want beautiful shoes and lovely shirts and they want something special for Eid. Similarly, when it comes to the orphans, our people that we often don't spend enough time with, we've decided that over the next few years and in the years that have gone by, to adopt an orphan for the day. We then go to the individuals and we have a sister that's on the committee at Machu Picchu, her name is Leila Parker. She physically goes and speaks to each orphan, sit them down, have a one-on-one -on -one interview with the individual, and these orphans range from five years old to about 20 years old and she'll ask very personal questions. What is it that you like doing? What kind of food do you enjoy? What is your favorite kind of clothing? What shoes would you like us to get this year for you? And so each kid has a very personalized list and a very personalized interview where we try to see into the soul of these young individuals and then a box like this is prepared. It's called an Eid Angel Box. Charity with dignity towards parity. And inside the box you'll find a guideline for the donor. This one, for example, the individual spoke about a toothbrush that she needs again. She spoke about soap and a face cloth and a certain pair of socks that she would like to have replaced. She spoke about a scarf that she needs for winter and she spoke about one packet of sweets please uncle but no chocolates and so each donor will get a very personalized list of goodies that the orphan would need for the day and then what we do is that we bring them to the masjid this will happen in two saturdays from now the last saturday of ramadan we bring them to the masjid we invite all of the donors who would have then gone through the the, the effort and the time to go shopping according to the list of goodies that is required and the donor would then hand over the box of goodies in this beautiful box that you see right here the box is then handed to the donor and the most beautiful thing then happens is that when you have a young orphan that opens up his or her box and in it he or she will find a pair of shoes that they could never really afford or a shirt or a dress that they so much wanted but could never really afford and then you see their eyes light up and it's the most beautiful feeling and it's the least that we could do for these orphans we know that our Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu was an orphan himself and had a deep deep heart feeling for the orphans of his time and that sincere feeling that our Prophet has taught us now flows through the generations and we are pleased that we were able to bring it into our Ramadan program this year as well. That's absolutely wonderful. We wish you everything of the best with this initiative and all the other efforts that you are doing here at Masjid Thank you Shukran. very much, Mabu, for having us. Thank you. We are in episode 7 of Living Ramadan and we are at the Azavia Masjid in Warmay State. Now, the Azavia Shoyu have served as the Akim of the Crescent Observer Society for decades. And according to some of the other information that was given to me about the Masjid, the current Imam, Sheikh Ahmed and Sheikh Siraj Hendricks, have sat at the feet of Sayyid Muhammad al Maliki for 11 years and cemented a 100 year relationship with the Maliki al Alawi al Hassani family. Now, the Azavia also has classes on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights for men and women, with classes for women on Wednesdays and every second Sunday as well. So quite a few activities that take place at the masjid itself. Right now we are going to be looking at a global perspective of Ramadan. 
Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Malika Omar and I am a Cape Townian, but I've been living in Dubai for almost 10 years. And one of my favorite things about Dubai is uh, celebrating Ramadan there. Uh, there's definitely a sense of togetherness, uh, no matter what one believes in. So everyone partakes in, uh, if it's fasting, uh, charity drives, uh, just spending time with the family. And there's just a general sense of spirituality and just connection and uh, calm amongst uh, everyone, all the expats and the locals in Dubai. I've moved back to Cape Town and although the experience is somewhat different, it's definitely still very special. I've been reconnecting with family, um, with my friends over here, uh, also reconnecting with my spirituality and my childhood. I remember spending Ramadan here when I was growing up. And, you know, I love how everyone over here is also very much into charity and uh, very much into, you know, sacrificing things during this month uh, to focus on uh, Quran and learning more about Islam. Um, you know, I have a friend who's who's going into the history of Islam as well and the prophets, may peace be upon them. And I was thinking the other day actually how it doesn't matter where you are in the world, um, but spending Ramadan with, with one's loved ones and, you know, trying to also take time for your creator as well it's it's we're all on this journey together no matter what we look like and where we live and that was a really wonderful realization and and just a, a, an example of how united we are as muslims we've come to the end of episode seven of loving ramadan for today i really hope you've enjoyed the program and looking forward to the next in the series Normally at the end of our session at the Masjid and today we at the Azavia Masjid, we would have spoken to one of the sheikhs, Sheikh Siraj Hendricks at this point in time, sadly had taken ill and was unable to be with us today. We certainly make dua for him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him and all other shuyukh and all other members of our society um, shifa inshallah and grant them good health moving forward. But uh, for the ending off of today's program, I suffice to say that it was a pleasure to be here at the Azavia Masjid and the Imam at here, Sheikh Ahmed and Sheikh Siraj Hendricks certainly are imbued with a wonderful spirit and there is so much history involved with this particular institution. Behind me some of the scriptures and the books in the shot have uh, traveled many many years over many uh, centuries in fact as well to be here at the Azavia so certainly wonderfully imbued with a beautiful spirit at the Azavia Masjid which celebrates its centenary in three years time. With that we bid you salam and we wish you peace and blessings. Remember to cherish every moment in the company of the special people in your life and let them know as often as possible that you cherish, appreciate them, and love them dearly. So long for now. Shukur goyam bar khudai mehraban On ke baashat khalq e kaun o makan On ke maara jism o jan bakhshid ast و <laughs> زمان پیغمبری تا که باشد مردمان را رهبری ساخت ما را از عطای بکران امت پیغمبری آخر زمان سا
ساخت ما را از عطای بکران قبط پیغمبر آخر زمان شکر گویم بر خدای مهربان آن که باشد خالق کون و مکان آن که ما را جسم و جان بخشید است او اینات او بیان بخشید است شکر گویم بهترین انبیار